All right, guys, I got 3.30. Everybody hear me okay? Yep. Okay, everybody see the whiteboard? Yep. All right, very good. All right, just a few things to go over today. So we meet tomorrow for lab. We're starting a brand new lab, which I believe I posted already up on B2L. Everybody gotten that or seen it, the new procedure? You know, it's there, correct? I don't remember what I did yesterday, much less last week. I think it's there. All right, so be ready to start that. So what we're gonna talk about today is um, essentially um, that experiment. We're gonna kind of go through what to expect across the next three weeks. That's gonna be a three week experiment as opposed to just one of these once and done ones that we've been doing lately. All right, and then the next thing I wanna talk about is I wanna talk a little bit about the um, formal report um, end of the lab, which is actually gonna be very, very simple and easy. And it's really just gonna be to have you do an abstract of one of the experiments that we've done. So I'll pick an experiment and we'll kind of go over what the expectations of that would be. And the idea is I wanna be able to get a copy of your abstract. I'll go over it, I'll correct it, make suggestions, this kind of thing, send it back to you. And then um, you'll do some modifications to it and then send it back to me and that'll be what your final grade will be based on. Okay, so there's really no reason why folks shouldn't get like a perfect score on this because I will have been graded and um, given you that feedback before I actually put a grade on it. So you have the opportunity to make corrections to it. All right, so let's um, start out actually by talking about the abstract, which is the formal report side of things. So anytime we write up a formal report, we write up a scientific paper, anything of that nature, we always start the paper with an abstract, all right? So if you read a scientific paper or something of that nature, you'll know that there's always a little paragraph right at the very front under the title that basically um, tells you within the space of just a few sentences inside of a paragraph in a very concise sort of way, What's the experiment about? What is it that I did and what did I get out of it and how did I do it, okay? So that's what an abstract is. So when we think about it, and I, one thing I'm gonna do this week is I'm going to give you guys an example abstract so you can see what the format's supposed to look like. So there's really two um, parts of this project that you really have to think about. First is getting the content right making sure that you're covering the bases, but doing it in a very concise way to keep it within a paragraph. And the second thing is you gotta get the format right. So the format ought to be easy because I'm gonna give you an example of an abstract, for example, out of a journal like analytical chemistry. And then you guys can take that abstract and use it as a model for what you're gonna do. Okay, so there's a basic format you're gonna see there. And you're just gonna follow that format. All right, but let's talk a little bit about the content. What's in an abstract? And we're gonna talk about the body of the abstract. Because obviously the title is gonna be there, then the body of the abstract, then your name, your affiliation will be there as well. But let's talk about the content. All right, so basically here's what we have to do in one paragraph. You guys thought you were gonna to have to write a whole paper. I'm only asking you for a paragraph. So that's easy, right? So. Let's pick an experiment. So here's the one we're gonna do. I think it's just gonna be a nice easy one and everybody will have gotten their grades back on this one. So you have something to work with. So let's do the um, calcium EDTA analysis, complex metric analysis one. That's an easy one. Everybody okay with that? So everybody's gonna write the same abstract on the same experiment. This is the experiment we're gonna do. All right, so what's in there? Well, the first thing is we want to know what. What is it that we did? Okay. The second thing we're going to ask is how. How did we do it? And then the last thing we find in the abstract are the key results. So here's what we got and what we take away from it. Okay. So these are the three questions that you have to answer. What did you do? How did you do it? 
and what are the key results? And you got a paragraph to do that. All right, so let's just kind of think about this as we go through it. If we go back through that experiment, what was the purpose of that experiment? Well, we wanted to analyze calcium as my unknown, right? I think we couched it as a hard water sample, did we not? Something like that. So that actually puts a little application behind it. So we're actually analyzing a calcium hard water unknown. Okay. That's what we're trying to do. Now you might put a sentence in there about why hard water is important or something we want to know about. But again, that's almost getting to be too much for an abstract. It's really kind of just keeping it down to a few sentences. Now, the next thing is the how part. How'd you do it? Okay, so here's what a lot of students are tempted to do when we ask about the how part. They want to go to the procedure and like write the whole procedure out again. No, that's not what you have in an abstract. Okay, the abstract is really taking it down to the very basic principles. How did you do it? It was a colorimetric titration, right? indicator titration. All right, so you might have a sentence in there or two about, you know, what specific color metric indicator titration you did. What was your titrant? What was your analyte? Okay, what other things did you have to add to it? Did you have a buffer in there? What kind of a um, indicator did you have to put in there? These are the kinds of things we're looking for as far as experimental details, okay? We don't really care how you did it. That comes later in the um, experimental part, which you guys don't have to write. Okay, and then what do you think the key results are gonna look like? What are we talking about there? Well, that's where we're really distilling down what we've got. So we're talking about a mean result. And then how did you record that result? I think it was milligrams of calcium per 100 mils right, something like that, of solution. And you can also add some statistics in there as well. So you had a standard deviation and you had a 95% confidence. Okay, was there anything else in there that we did? That wasn't one where we had to like calculate a molar absorptivity or anything funny like that. I mean, this is really kind of a really straight up experiment. So it ought to be easy to pretty much condense those things easily down into a simple paragraph, okay? So that's really what we're talking about here. So again, what I think I'll do for you this week, the week has really caught up with me, is come up with just an example abstract. Um, I'll go to the literature and find one. It's not gonna have anything to do with this experiment, but you can at least see what the abstract ought to look like. All right. And from there, I think we might as well have this due next Tuesday. And what I think I'm gonna do is just not do a quiz next Tuesday. And we'll just replace the quiz with the abstract. So that way you don't have to go study for a quiz. You can just bring the abstract and we're good. Does that sound good to everybody? I mean, it shouldn't take more than a week to write a paragraph on an experiment you've already done, right? Yeah, you said that um, at the beginning, you said we could uh, like send it to you and that you would send it back. Um, so if the if the deadline is next Tuesday, when do you want it to like for us to turn it in the first time, I guess? Yeah, that's the first time. So the first draft okay. will be on Tuesday. So your first draft will be Tuesday. OK, so then what I'll do is I'll take it and I'll look at it and I'll mark it up for you. I'll give it back the next Tuesday. And then we have one more lab meeting after that. So the idea I think is that then I can get it from you before you leave for the semester and then I'll put a final grade on it. Or you can send it to me electronically or whatever the case may be. But this gives me a chance to mark it up and give it back to you guys. Um, I guess it would be that last lab, wouldn't it? If I think ahead. And that's fine, just as long as um, I've got a marked up copy I can give you guys back, that's the important thing. And then after that, then it's just a simple matter of you getting me the final copy, which you can do electronically if we don't meet again, okay? So I think it's gonna work out time-wise, okay. So your first draft is due next Tuesday.
And like I say, I will return the marked up copies um, then the next week after that. And then I think we're done. Okay, so at that point you can make your um, corrections and then send them to me electronically. And I'll put a due date on that. It'll be before finals week. All right, so that makes sense. So what I owe you at this point is gonna be an example abstract. So you guys can just kind of see what one looks like and what the formatting on an abstract ought to look like. So that I'll get out to you this week, probably tomorrow. So you have plenty of time to put this together. But you should have everything you need to be able to do this. And again, it's just a title, the body of the abstract, your name and your affiliation, we're done. All right, any questions off the top of your heads, guys? Sound good? All right. Next thing, we wanna introduce the experiment we're gonna do. And by the way, for tomorrow, um, I'm gonna put together a quiz. It'll probably be on the uh, glucose analysis stuff as you guys did it. So um, make sure you're looking back over the kinds of things that you had to do. And also keep in mind your glucose analysis is due tomorrow. So all your graphs and curves and all that stuff should be ready to go. One question that came up and it does happen every year is sometimes when you do those rate plots, the zero first in order, second order ones, Sometimes you'll run into a situation where there's going to be a rogue point on there. Okay. It's usually the last point for the um, final time, I believe. You can eliminate that point. It doesn't have to show up on the plot. Okay. Because sometimes you get an undefined value or just a really weird value when you do that one. Just leave it off. So if there looks like to, there's a certain point that just does not belong on the plot, just get rid of it. Okay. So if you ran into that situation, just eliminate that data point. All right, does that make sense to everybody? You might have seen that if you haven't worked it up and you see something like that, now you know what to do with it. All right, so glucose lab is due tomorrow and um, we'll have a quiz tomorrow and that should be everything. I don't think I've done another homework or anything like that. We may actually be done with homework for the semester, so we'll just see how things go. All right, guys, because I do want you emphasizing that um, abstract um, as far as doing other stuff goes. And we are kind of running out of weeks here. So we'll see, I might get one more homework squeezed in. We'll see how it goes. All right, so let's talk about the experiment you guys are gonna to start tomorrow. So as always, I like to define what the analyte is. In other words, what we're looking for. The analyte's gonna be calcium ion. seems like we've been doing a lot of calcium ion. So this is just another way of doing it, okay? So we're gonna do this across three weeks. So I'm gonna sort of show you what's gonna happen each week. So week one, this is tomorrow. We're gonna to do the standardization of the titrant. Now, this is gonna be a different titration. This is actually an example of a redox titration that we're gonna do. Okay, so it involves a redox reaction. And it's one you guys have seen before. I'm gonna give you the unbalanced reaction and let you guys balance it in your notebooks using half reaction methods. So cut down basically as a net ionic equation. It's C2O4 two minus reacting with permanganate, MnO4 one minus. And the two products are gonna be um, manganese two plus and you're gonna make carbon dioxide gas. Everything else is an aqueous solution. And you're gonna be doing this under acidic conditions. So I'm gonna put an H plus up there so you know that this is a redox reaction that needs to be balanced under acidic conditions, okay? So that's one of the things I'm gonna be looking for in your notebook is that balanced redox reaction. So there is, is, is an unbalanced reaction for you to start with. All right, so here's the deal. Oxalate here is gonna come in as sodium oxalate. That's a solid that we can dry and weigh out. So that makes a really good primary standard. 
Okay. The permanganate is going to be the titrant. And the goal of week one is I want to calculate the molarity. I need to determine the molarity of the titrant. All right. So there's the redox reaction that's going to allow us to do that unbalanced. Okay, so it's a standard standardization kind of titration here where we're going to titrate with a um, titrant whose concentration we don't know. And we can titrate against a primary standard that we can make up in the lab whose concentration we do know. Okay, so the sodium oxalate, I've already got it cooking in the oven. We're going to dry it at 120 degrees C, which is actually happening right now. Each bench is going to make up a um, known solution of it. So you're going to make up 100 mils. I think you add like a tenth of a gram or something like that. You know, put it all in 100 mils or something like that of acid. And you're going to make that solution up. And then everybody at the bench is going to use that solution. And the nice thing is, since it's primary standard, you know the grams of it you took and you know the mills that you're going to take it to in the ball flask, you've got its concentration. Okay. So if you know its concentration and you know the um, volume of it that you're going to take, right, you got the moles of it. You're going to titrate with um, the titrant. And the titrant's going to be around 0 0.02 molar in permanganate. Now, here's the deal. Potassium permanganate, and it's actually made up as potassium permanganate, which you guys may have seen before. It's a really nice purple crystalline material. Now, the deal is, though, with potassium permanganate is that, yeah, you can clean it up pretty well and make up a solution of it. But the problem is, as soon as it goes into the solution state, it undergoes decomposition. So it's decomposed catalytically by light, among other things. So the problem is, is you can make up a solution that's exactly 0.02 molar of it, but after a day, the concentration will have changed, OK? So the idea there is that even though I can make it up to an approximate or even exact concentration, it's not going to hold that concentration. There's going to be some decomposition. And that decomposition is going to change the concentration. And that's why we ultimately have to um, standardize it. OK, so you're going to have a concentration around 0.02 molar. Your goal is to calculate the exact concentration of it after it undergoes a little bit of decomposition. Now we end up speeding that along when I make the solution by heating it up really well. So the heat kind of catalyzes and moves that decomposition reaction along. So by the time I filter it all out and put it in a brown glass bottle, it's gonna be at a stable concentration and you can standardize it. All right, so that's what has to happen. That's gonna be week one, okay? So what about week two? Well, week two is going to involve forming a precipitate using your unknown. All right, so I'm going to provide you with an unknown calcium sample, just like you normally get. And in week two, you're going to make a precipitate. Now, guess what? You guys have done that before, right? If you go back to the crucible lab that you did way back at the beginning of the semester, what did you do? You took a calcium unknown, right? And you added some precipitating agent to it and you formed a precipitate. Then what did you do? Well, you let the precipitate um, basically um, digest and fall to the bottom of a beaker. And then you isolated it in a crucible and you weighed it, right? And then from the mass of the precipitate, you were able to get a mass of calcium back out. Okay, we could do it that way, but we're not going to. We're still going to make the precipitate, but then we're going to do something else with it. So here's the reaction. Same reaction you pretty much used before. I'm going to take a calcium ion. I'm going to let it react with an excess of oxalate, C2O42 minus, which is exactly what you guys did in the gravimetric lab. And you're going to make calcium oxalate precipitate. I think it has a water of hydration attached to it. Okay. So that's my precipitate. So 
that's all you're going to do on week two. You're going to make the precipitate and you're going to let it digest. Now, week three, which is the final week, is you're going to isolate the precipitate using filter paper. But we're not going to weigh it this time. Now we're going to do a titration. You're going to redissolve an acid. And by the way, this up here has to happen in base. I forgot to tell you that because remember the calcium oxalate forms in base. In this case, the base we're going to use is ammonia. So then what we're going to do is we're going to um, redissolve the cleaned precipitate. in acid and then what we're going to do is we're going to titrate all right so now you have to say all right so we're going to redissolve everything and we're going to titrate it with the um, standardized permanganate Right, so the permanganate is what we standardized in week one. So we know it's exact concentration. But here's the deal. What's the permanganate actually reacting with? Well, think about what happens when I redissolve the precipitate. Here's where we have CaC2O4, and we'll put the water of hydration on here. Now, if we acidify this, we break it back up, right? So I end up with calcium two plus, plus C2O4, two minus, right? And a water, I want to get rid of that water of hydration. All right, so what do you see there that the um, permanganate might react with? Oxalate. Oxalate, yeah. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take the oxalate and we're going to let that react with the permanganate. Oh, you've seen that reaction before, right? Because that's the one where we make the carbon dioxide gas and the uh, manganese too that you guys used, guess what? Back in the um, standardization step. So here's the deal. If you look at a mole bridge here, if I know the number of moles of oxalate that got reacted with the permanganate, which I can determine from the titration, do I have the moles of calcium? Yeah. Because yeah. you got a mole bridge between the two, right? So for every uh, mole of um, oxalate that you use up, you got a mole of calcium. Okay, so we got a mole bridge between those two things. So we can relate them just like that. So ultimately then from a permanganate titration, I'm actually getting back to the calcium ion that was brought into the solution as the precipitate, okay? And then redissolved. So now I can go ahead and titrate the oxalate and from that get the calcium ion concentration back out. Does that make sense? So then what we're going to report is the calcium ion concentration. I forget if it's parts per million or what I asked for. So it's actually kind of a neat experiment. Now, the other thing that's kind of cool about this is that if you go back to the week one part here, which is where we're doing the standardization, we could ask, okay, in a redox titration like this, when do we know when we're done? When do we know we've hit the end point? Okay, so normally what we'd have to do here is we'd have to throw some sort of a um, indicator in here, right? And the indicator would change color right around the equivalence point to tell me what the end point would be. That's what we did in the case of the acid base titration with the kombucha. It's also what we did in the case of the calcium EDTA titration. But the nice thing about permanganate, is anybody ever seen it in solution? 
You know what color it is? Isn't it blue? It's almost kind of like a deep purple. Yeah, it's a deep purple. Okay, so that's sort of a um, property of the permanganate is that it's very, very highly colored. So if you have a more concentrated solution of it, it's actually deep purple. But if you have a very dilute solution of it, it's actually kind of a pale pink. So the nice thing about this is that permanganate is actually used as its own indicator. So think about this reaction as I've got, got it up here written. Okay, we're going ahead and we're adding permanganate, right? And the permanganate's reacting with the oxalate. As long as you got an excess of oxalate, which is clear and colorless, and you add permanganate, right? The solution is going to remain clear and colorless. But as soon as you have a slight excess of permanganate in there, because you've used up all the oxalate, what are you going to see? Change of color. You're going to see a change of color. You're actually going to see a little bit of pink develop, right? Because now there's a very slight excess of the permanganate in there because we've used up all the oxalate. That's your endpoint. So in this case, we consider the permanganate to be what we call a self-indicator. We don't actually have to add a secondary indicator to the solution. The permanganate itself acts as the indicator when it goes into a slight excess. Does that make sense? And you guys will see that tomorrow. The other thing that we have to do is this reaction can be a little bit slow at times. So another thing that we do, and we'll do it as well tomorrow, is we actually, during the titration, typically heat the reaction up a little bit. And we actually end up calculating in advance about how much permanganate we think we're going to need to get to the end point, assuming a 0.02 molar concentration of it. And then we end up adding maybe about 10% less than what we calculate to get us up close to the end point. And then we approach the rest of it dropwise until we hit the end point. And again, that speeds the reaction up because we're putting a lot of reactant in there. Okay, so that's another little trick we use to kind of move things along, if you will. All right, so the goal for tomorrow is to actually prepare a primary standard solution of the oxalate, which will be shared amongst a bench. And then what you're going to do is you're going to then individually using your microburette, you're going to then um, <clears throat> titrate that with permanganate to the end point. We'll try to get about four trials of that done, which is not a problem because it's a microburette titration. And then from there, we'll be able to move on to week two. So that's our goal for tomorrow. All right. Get through the standardization part. All right. Any questions so far, guys? And again, that's just kind of a real broad overview of where we're headed with the experiment. All right, no questions? Everybody's all right? Doesn't seem like any questions. All right, good. Tomorrow you might have some. All right, so now we get into the background. So we've introduced the um, experiment, introduced the topic. This is what we're doing for the next three weeks. So now let's go back and start introducing some stuff that um, sort of peripherally works into redox titrations. But it gives me a chance to talk about some other stuff that normally we would do in dynamics, but we normally don't get very far with. And that's electrochemistry and electrode potentials. By the way, where are you guys in um, dynamics right now? What are you studying? Buffers today. Okay, so you're doing buffers now. Okay, well, you guys should all be acing that, right? Yeah, I hope so. All right, so what we want to focus on here are redox reactions. Okay, so if I'm talking about a redox reaction and I want to classify it as a type of reaction, we know that it's a reaction that involves the transfer of electrons. Okay, we studied those last semester, right? All right, so we have some basic um, 
definitions here that when we talk about redox reactions, we can break them down into either oxidation half reactions or reduction half reactions. So again, going back to our definitions from last semester, if something gets oxidized, what's happening to it? What's it doing? It's losing electrons. Good. So oxidation is the loss of electrons. So reduction is the opposite of that. That's got to be the gain of electrons. OK. So we know that in a redox reaction, both of those things have to be happening. So a redox reaction um, has a situation where we have simultaneous oxidation and reduction occurring. And that's because electrons have to move from one species to the other. If something's losing them, something else has to gain them, right? So then we also, based on that definition, have a reducing agent and an oxidizing agent. Then there's the secret agent, but hey, he doesn't come around here. So the reducing agent is always the species that gets oxidized. The oxidizing agent therefore has to be the species that gets reduced. Okay. Because when you think about an agent, what does an agent do? An agent helps something happen or it makes something happen. Okay, so the reducing agent makes reduction occur. And it does that by becoming oxidized. So it's providing the electrons that are required for reduction. Okay, and you could say the same about the oxidizing agent. It's the thing that's allowing oxidation to occur. So it has to be the thing then that takes the electrons from the species that's being oxidized. All right, so if we really wanted to boil this down to a very, very simple example, I always, back in bonding, do this one. Okay, so for example, everybody's seen this reaction at some point. I can take solid magnesium, I can burn it in the presence of oxygen gas. And you guys know what we make. We end up making solid magnesium oxide. Okay, and this one's easy because you can just go ahead and balance it by, um, looking at it. So let's see, I need two oxygens over there. So that means I need two magnesiums over there. Okay, so that's an easy one to balance. You just do it by inspection. So now what I like to do is think about what's actually happening. This is an example of a redox reaction. Something here is gaining electrons. Something here is losing electrons. So I put charges on things. So we're talking about magnesium metal here, oxygen gas. So both of those carry a neutral charge. Now the magnesium oxide on the other side also carries a neutral charge. But if we break it up in terms of its component ions, we see that we have a magnesium two plus and an oxide two minus, okay? So now if we actually tie these things together, the magnesium on the left can be tied to the magnesium on the right. And you can ask yourself what's happening to it per magnesium, right? Is it gaining or losing electrons? Be gaining or losing, sorry, not gaining. losing. Yeah, yeah, because it's going from a neutral charge to a more positive charge. So it's got to be losing electrons. So if we lose electrons, that's oxidation, right? So we say that the magnesium now is being oxidized. Now, if it's being oxidized, that makes it the reducing agent, right? Now, look at the oxygen. Starts neutral. And it goes to the two minus state. So what's happening to the oxygen? Is it gaining or losing electrons? Gaining. Gaining.
So that's reduction, right? So if it's undergoing reduction, that makes it the oxidizing agent because it's allowing for the magnesium to be oxidized. Okay. So we can look at a reaction like this and just by looking at the shifting or the changing of the charges of the various things from one end of the arrow to the other, we can identify this as a redox reaction and even to some degree quantify okay, the degree to which things are being oxidized or reduced. Then the other thing you guys know you can do is you can break this down into half reactions if you want to, right? So we could actually break this down into an oxidation half reaction and a reduction half reaction if we wanted to do that. And that's ultimately what we normally do in the case of, um, of um, normal redox reactions that we like to talk about, say, back in bonding. Okay, now this particular one is an example of what we call a heterogeneous redox reaction. So when we talk about a heterogeneous reaction like this, what we're saying is the actual electron transfer occurs across a phase boundary. as we'll explain in just a second. So across two different phases, all right? So in this case, what's happening? What are my two phases, solid and gas, right? So the magnesium exists in the solid form and the oxygen exists in the gaseous form. So when the electrons get transferred between the oxygen and the magnesium, the electrons are actually transferred across a phase boundary, okay? Now, if this were happening between ions and solution, that would be called a homogeneous redox reaction because everything's within the same phase. In that case, it would be within the solution phase, okay? Now, the reason I bring this up is because ultimately we wanna talk about redox reactions in the context of an electrochemical cell or a battery. And in the case of a battery, that's also an example of a heterogeneous redox reaction, as we're gonna see. All right, so ultimately when we talk about this kind of thing, we usually talk about it in the context of a battery or what we call an electrochemical cell. That's another just fancy uh, name for a battery, okay? So let's talk about a battery here. So here's the deal. What do we use a battery to do? What, what's the whole purpose of a battery? Why do we have them? Create current. Current and voltage, right? So the idea here is that voltage is essentially a form of potential energy. And we use voltage to move charge. And the movement of charge is current, OK? So that's what a battery does for it. It allows us to store potential energy. And then when we tap a battery into a circuit, we can then, by the movement of charge, convert that potential energy into useful energy. And that could be like running a motor or lighting up a light bulb or something like that, OK? So how does it work? So basically a battery just consists of a redox reaction, all right? And a fancy term for a battery is what we call a galvanic cell. And when I say we have a galvanic cell, what that means is that I've got a spontaneous reaction. So the reaction has to be spontaneous to give us energy, okay? Now, here's a simple one. And normally when we talk about a battery, we'll do it in what we would normally call a two compartment or a two beaker cell. So I'm gonna take two beakers and sort of line them up next to each other. 
like that. <clears throat> I'm going to put some liquid in both of them. Okay. Now I'm also going to submerge in here two electrodes. So essentially, this could be a chunk of metal, it could be a cylinder, whatever the case may be, but it's going to be metal. Okay, so over on the left, that one's going to be zinc. The one over on the right is going to be copper. They're both in the solid state. So we're talking about essentially metallic zinc, metallic copper. Okay. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to hook them together with a wire. Now, remember, what we want to do is measure the voltage difference that exists between these two, where voltage is the potential energy difference we can get out of this. Okay, so this thing is just going to be a voltmeter. So this lets me measure the voltage difference between the two electrodes. Okay. Now, I also have to have some stuff down in solution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some zinc ion down in here. So we'll make that a zinc two plus. And I better put some copper ion down here on this side. So I'll make that a copper two plus. Okay, and I could do that by introducing soluble zinc or copper salts into these things. All right. And now the question becomes, would anything happen if I do this? Would anything happen? No, at this point, absolutely nothing would happen. And the reason for that is because I have not completed my circuit. Okay, so think about, for example, if you build a circuit and the whole idea is to take a battery and use it to light up a light bulb, what do I have to do? Well, I have to actually apply a wire that's connected to the light bulb to both poles of the battery, don't I? If I don't do that, then nothing happens. In other words, I haven't completed the circuit. So another way of thinking of this is that charge has to have a complete circular pathway through which it can flow. And right now, it's kind of like I've got an open switch here. Does anybody see where the open switch would be that's keeping the um, two from talking to each other? Reconnecting the electrodes. So it's kind of reconnecting the electrodes through the solutions, right? So notice the beakers are still not connected to each other through the solutions. So in this case, it's kind of like I've got a big switch right here that's open, okay? So how do I get around that? Well, what I do is I introduce what's called a salt bridge here. So the salt bridge is basically like a U-shaped tube that actually connects these two things. So ignore my switch there. This is like closing the switch, if you will. Usually you put a little frit here so that ions can pass through there, but essentially um, nothing else does. Okay, so normally what I would do is I would fill this salt bridge with like an aqueous paste of some sort of a soluble salt like KCL or something like that. All right, so what that means is I got tons of ions in there, lots and lots of ions. Now, why do I care? Well, think about now how we can move charge around this thing, okay? So what ends up happening here is that over on the left-hand side over here, we call that the anode, by the way. And we call the anode because that's where oxidation occurs. And here's the reaction that's happening. I've got solid zinc being oxidized to zinc two plus, it's losing electrons. And I'm kicking out two electrons, okay? So you can see that's oxidation. Zinc is losing electrons to go to zinc two plus. Well, if oxidation is happening on that side, reduction needs to be happening on the other side. Because remember, if this is a redox reaction. I have to have both those processes, processes happening simultaneously. So this is called the cathode. And that's where reduction happens. So in this case, how would I write the reduction reaction? Well, I've got copper two plus in the solution, right? It can pick up the two electrons that were given up by the zinc and I end up making solid copper metal. 
Okay, so you can see how the opposite thing is happening there. So if you think about it, what's happening? The electrons that are given up over on the left-hand side, what are they doing? They're moving through the wire, right? Over to the right-hand side where they're needed so that the um, cathode re reaction or reduction reaction can take place over there. Everybody see that? So the zinc metal is giving up two electrons. Those two electrons are moving through the wire and over to the copper where they're needed. Okay, so above this thing where we connect the two electrodes, it's the flow of electrons through the wire that provide the current and current is just moving charge, right? But now what's happening to complete the circuit? <clears throat> well, it's the movement of ions. Okay, that matters down there. Because let's think about what's happening. As I've got this zinc electrode here, what's happening? I've got oxidation happening there. So zinc metal is actually being converted to zinc two plus. Okay, so I'm actually withering away that electrode there. It's like rusting away, and I'm converting zinc metal to zinc ion in solution. Okay, but what's happening on the other side? Over there, I'm getting a plating out reaction happening because on the right hand side, I'm taking copper two ion, which is in solution, and I'm collecting it onto the electrode as copper metal because that's what the cathode reaction tells me is happening. Okay, so the zinc electrode's weathering away, and the copper electrode's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger as more copper plates out on it. But look what's happening I'm getting a charge imbalance in those solutions, right? So notice here that on the left-hand side, I'm getting an excess of positive charge from zinc two plus, aren't I? So what ends up having to happen? Well, chloride, for example, could come out of here to balance that charge. For every zinc two plus that I'm putting into solution, I could get two chloride ions coming out of the salt bridge to even out the charge imbalance. So then what's happening on the other side? Those copper two plus is leaving the solution and plating out on the electrode. I could actually have potassium ion coming back in to replace it over on this side to keep the charge balanced. Okay, so what's happening? Ions are moving in and out of the salt bridge. And when ions move in solution, that's current. So you can see that charge can flow whether or not it's through a wire up top or whether or not it's the movement of ions in and out of the salt bridge down below. But the point is charge is moving and charge that's moving is called current. Doesn't matter how I move it or what it is, as long as it's moving, okay? So that's how a battery actually does what it has to do. And this is an example of a very, very early battery, all right? So what ends up happening here is that there's a potential or voltage difference that's causing this whole thing to happen. Why is it that the electrons want to move from left to right through the wire? Well, because zinc has a tendency from a thermodynamics point of view to be oxidized relative to copper, which wants to be reduced. So there's a driving force, if you will, a potential energy because of those <coughs> properties of those two metals that's forcing the electrons from left to right. Okay? So that's a voltage, right? That's a potential difference. That's a potential energy source, all right? So that's where the energy from the battery is coming from, okay? Does that make sense to everybody? Kind of, sorta? Yep. And at this point, the main thing I want you to see is that this is a dynamic process and that you've got oxidation happening on one side, you've got reduction happening on the other side and the two processes have to happen together, okay? And it's that movement of electrons spontaneously from one side of the cell to the other that's generating that potential energy difference from which we get the voltage associated with the battery. And we can measure that voltage with the voltmeter that I stick in there. So that tells me what that potential energy difference between both sides of the cell is going to be. And that's going to be the amount of volts that I get out of the battery, okay? So if you have a nine volt battery, well, that means that those two sides have a nine volt potential energy difference between them. And I can tap into that 
energy source to do things, to convert that potential energy into some kind of kinetic or useful energy. All right, I think that's enough for today. Everybody good? Yep. All right, so we'll do some standardization tomorrow, guys. So remember to bring your labs with you. And remember, we'll do a quiz tomorrow and we'll focus in on the um, enzyme stuff. All right, guys, I will see you tomorrow. Have a good day. All right, you too. Have a good one. Will do. I have a question on the lab for tomorrow. Yeah, go ahead. So I was just doing it and with our, um, like the epsilon, so I guess how we find the, we did the long